itself. And it's no accident that generation after generation, America drops further and further in every educational category, while the little elite-lits are groomed in institutions that might as well be on Mars as far as the rest of us are concerned, because we ain't getting in. Well, one person leading the teachers leave those kids alone charge is today's guest, Kara St. Louis. You might remember just a few weeks ago when I had on Harold Kautzvela, I had mentioned that he had co-authored a hefty conspiratorial tome entitled Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation. And on that show, Harold and I discussed the details of the silent assimilation of chemtrail sprayed nanoparticles and the invading alien black goo AI. Well, now we're going to get the other side of the coin with the Dangerous Imagination half of the book and the many campaigns the puppet masters have instituted to make us forget our own creative power as well as the aforementioned systematic dumbing down of the people and the institution of an oppressive school system meant to churn out nothing more than mindless, cubicle-aspiring drones. Kara has studied and written about this slice of the conspiracy pie more than most people I know, and I'm happy to have her here to talk about it and more. Kara St. Louis, welcome to THC. Hello, Greg. I'm so happy to be here and represent my half of this, this message. Um, we call it a no, uh, no excuses book, and I think that's basically what it is. A one-two punch. <laughs> well said. Thanks for being here. I, I do love both parts of you and Harold's book. Yeah. It's interesting to hear about invading spider beans and alien black goo, but it's hard <laughs> to do much with that information, you know? <laughs> right. But your half about social engineering and restrictive schooling is a lot easier to digest and verify, and it's just as dangerous. And yes. I suppose if we're going to dive into the modern school system, the story starts with Prussia, or what we call Germany now. But I guess talk to us about Prussia. Is this where you'd say the story begins? It is for the modern uh, world. Certainly it is for, I would say, the, the very deep capturing of the human race uh, that started with events in Prussia. And actually it was a response to uh, a loss. The Prussian emperor and the Prussian army lost to Napoleon in 1805 at the Battle of Vienna. And if you know anything about the Prussian army at that time, it was sort of this this mercenary force for hire, it was unstoppable and um, it just sort of cut and burned its way across Europe. And, and there was no, it would, it never lost anything. And so in fact, it did lose to Napoleon in 1805, which was extremely embarrassing because um, Napoleon's army was rank amateurs and volunteers and all those sorts of things. And I think the reason that the arm, that the Prussian army lost is because there was a change in the imagination of the, typical Prussian soldier. There are a few things to know about that before, you know, so that's a setup before we launch into how this education system came to be crafted and used. And um, first of all, it was far more, you were far more likely if you were a Prussian soldier in 1805 to die at the hands of your superior officer than you were at the hands of an enemy. That's how ruthless the hierarchy was in the Prussian army. Damn. That's the first thing that you need to know. The second thing that we really ought to mention is that it had been ramped up considerably, this army, it, with the last emperor that um, sort of devised and revised his standing army, and, and that would have been Frederick II. Now, a couple of things we should know about him, because just because they're interesting and because we should know this about ourselves as human beings. Frederick was, first of all, Frederick was gay. And in families, the elite families now and then, the biggest aberration that, that could happen was that you would have a baby born that was had some um, uh, ability for empathy and compassion and love and, and you know, goodwill toward its fellow man. That, to them, that is and was um, an unacceptable aberration. Right. Uh, just, just as if we, you and I, had children that were born as psychopaths, that would pretty much be not okay with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Frederick the first was so outraged that this child had been born to him that he decided to do something about it. And this is what he did. He killed, uh, Frederick the second's partner, his, his lover in front of him, uh, by way of guillotine, by way of, uh, what, what, I can only say guillotine. I can't remember what it's called in English. Beheading? Now. Beheading. Yes, he was beheaded. And the reason he did that is because beheading creates in the human being who sees it a psychotropic response. It is this crazy, out of your body, you know, uh, completely malleable, completely psychedelic response and that we have to, some, to that particular visual. Hmm. Um, 
which is what explains the crowds in the French Revolution and their um, ecstasy at seeing these people beheaded. In fact, if you read about any kind of beheading, that's the kind of crowd reaction that you will get. And just as a side, as a sidebar, I always like to note when I talk about that, that we are also seeing guillotines show up in FEMA camps. We ah. have been reading about that, remember? Mm -hmm. And and wondering why. Well, this is something to know about a human reaction to a beheading, okay? We just have to sort of know that and park it somewhere and have that information. It breaks people. Yes, it breaks well, it breaks people and it causes it causes this weird euphoria thing and then this onset of psychosis. Okay. So mm. um or psycho we, they would call it psychopathy. So in fact that did work and it worked rather well with Frederick II. And in the end, after this had occurred and he had sort of recovered from it, he was worse than any of them. And he took his army and he made it even that much more relentless and unstoppable and vicious and all of those things. So for him to lose to Napoleon at the Battle of Vienna was absolutely unacceptable. And the reason seems to be that um, some of the soldiers decided they didn't want to die and turned around and went home. Well, they could imagine not dying <laughs> for <laughs> their emperor. And so that had to be stopped. And, and, and so that is why this schooling system, which is really nothing more than an exercise in subjugation, was tried. And I say tried again, because it's really not the first time that this was floated. This goes all the way back to Plato. But I don't I don't go all the way back there with it, because what I'm trying to do is bring the 20th century, because the 20th century, with the exception of this lead up of the Prussian education system, is hard enough. To, to digest, you know, and mm -hmm. you don't want to overwhelm people. It, the farther back you go, the, the more likely people are to shut off and not hear you because it just seems too big. And, you know, they can't do anything about it. And Plato, why are you talking to me about Plato? <laughs> oh, my God, I can't do anything about Plato. You know, so so that's just the wrong tap to take when you're trying to disseminate something very general that people need to know so that they can do something about their lives. And I will say then that going back to the Prussian education system, um, an education system was devised then that was meant to create an obedient servant of the state, someone who would die for their country. And frankly, we live in the United States. We have a relationship to that idea, don't we? Mm -hmm. The greatest good is to die for your nation. <laughs> this is this is pure Prussian bullshit. OK, right. can I say that on your show? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Cause I need to know what my parameters are here. Okay. So, and in fact, um, that, that began to be put into use in Prussia in 1818. And that was only going to be a real problem if you happen to be a Prussian and, and, and even then probably if you were only if you were a male. So, uh, unfortunately, the French Minister of Education got a look at this, was absolutely elated and took it back to France. So France, um, implemented this form of education as well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it ended up in the United States about the mid, about 1850, right in there. Um, and that is because Horace Mann, who was, by the way, not this great big um, saint of education that everybody thinks he is, but in fact was an attorney working for the railroad interests, uh, went to Germany, got a whiff of this education system, thought, oh, this is fantastic. My employers are going to love this because migrants were coming back into the United States who were standing up for their rights. And this is what the, uh, the this is what the industrialists simply could not have. So to have this education system come back into the United States was something that they very much desired. Now, it hit Massachusetts first. Mm -hmm. All right. And it took forever. It took forever to get a single solitary state to acknowledge or to, to go ahead and bring this in. And um, with Massachusetts, it was interesting because in in Mass, they formed the very first board of education. It was privately funded by an industrialist. And of course, uh, they, of course right. And they presented this idea of um, mandatory schooling, which we did not have. I mean, we had a very, very literate population. We had a tremendously literate population. Everyone read and everyone see, and people don't realize that they don't know that anymore. Right. People read Spinoza. I mean, we were a literate bunch. We were not illiterate. Just look at the works of that time versus the works of today. That's right. We were not illiterate. However, they wanted they wanted to make schooling mandatory. They wanted to warehouse the 95 percent of us that they felt they needed to the 5 percent felt that they needed to control. So there were two things going on. They 
they, they wanted the Prussian education system in place because it was uh, exercise and subjugation. And they wanted to get the children because they were the most um, vulnerable. And they wanted to make it mandatory. They had, they had to go to school. Anyway, the first board of education, the governor of Massachusetts kicked them right out of his office, said, no, thank you. Here's your money back. We don't want this. But they kept trying, 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 trying. And finally, by one measly vote, and I would love to know who that was, <laughs> one measly vote, they finally got the Board of Education reinstated in Massachusetts, and they pushed through this mandatory education system. And by the way, those children, the first children who went to school because they had to go to school were actually marched there by the, um, by the militia, by oh. the National Guard, because their parents were rioting. Really? Their parents were rioting. They did not want this to happen. And they knew what was going on. They knew what was going on, that their children were being kidnapped. And they suspected there might be some, What I don't know how they put it, but they suspected that there might be some brainwashing involved. Um, that's how we would put it. So, yes, the parents were actually rioting. And just like in Selma, Alabama, um, those children were marched to school. Wow. So it was many, many years. It was like 15 years or something like that before another state finally adopted it. But I will tell, I will tell you that, um, it was so successful in terms of what the industrialists and the government were after that by the time Mao Zedong had just finished his Chinese, you know, revolution, mm -hmm. uh, within about five minutes of the end of that, the successful completion of that, our friend, our friend John Dewey, who was the Fabian Socialist running the Department of Education at Columbia University and one of the Frankfurt School, um, was in China talking, setting up this education system for them and laying it on a very stunned populace, but absolutely no idea what had just happened to them and what was going to happen. Hmm. So they got, they got that into China as fast as humanly possible. So you're talking about a period of time between 1850 and 1920. All right. And it's global now. Um, right. if you need to ask me anything, Greg, just, just please feel free to interject because once I start talking about there's, there's this, there's lots to say. So, oh, of course I, I like to let my guests have as much room as they need. Cause I'm here all the time. But uh, one mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. one thing about Prussia that I thought was interesting that I have here in my notes is apparently all the Royal houses of Europe uh, are Prussian. Is that true? Yes, that's probably very true. Uh, right. Thomas Sheridan says that that's the case. Uh, most of them are German and they probably can be traced back to the original Prussian family. So now you're talking about some Prussian history that I find to be tremendously interesting. Right. Um, Prussia, um, Germany used to be a collection of tribal. And, and, you know, I don't really want any, any bad, con any negative connotations associated with the word tribal. Um, but it used to be what 174, something along those lines, tribe, tribes, right. um, feudal tribes that we're doing just fine. If you've been to Germany, you know that it is a bountiful land. It is it is particularly well suited to support human life naturally. It's why everybody's always after control of Germany. Mm. Um anyway, there were the, there was this collection of folks called the Teutonic Knights. And the Teutonic Knights in about the year 1100, 1100 right in there. I don't have the dates at my fingertips anymore, but I will be writing about that soon again. So um, anyway, they were sent from the Middle East. They were sent from the Knights Templar to go back to Germany and form this synthetic uh, concoction that was that they then called Prussia. So Prussia has been in formation for a very, very long time with a very, very specific purpose. Um, you, it, the thing you have to, the thing that I think we should bear in mind when we're talking about the Middle East, the Knights Templar, and the Teutonic Knights is that. There is some serious evidence from the Gnostic texts that indicate that there was a sort of cosmic infection, archontic infection mm. that landed in the Middle East, which is not to say, this is not a judgment. I have a bit of a cold. You'll have to forgive me. But uh, this no is not a, a, not a judgment about people who were living in the Middle East when this happened. It simply is what seems to have happened. Um, and this some people say is what you can trace this psychopathy amongst our rulers back to is this original infection that began in the Middle East and was spread. Um, so the Teutonic Knights went and unified 
for better or for worse, the German tribes that were living probably quite happily. And that became Prussia. Um, and yes, there is a woman that I, I can't remember her name right now. If it comes to me, I will say it, but I am chasing her like crazy right now. She's a slob. And, um, she has done a series of, um, I don't know, 40 or 50, uh, videos that are all terrific. And it's on YouTube. It is called New Earth. The Survivors of Atlantis, I think is the first one. Hmm. New Earth, New Earth, the Survivors. All right. And she is one of the two people right now whom I find to be extremely credible, who is discussing at a period of time, <laughs> a period of history, which I think we can all agree right now is complete and other utter codswallop. Right. We don't know. We don't know what, what happened. We just don't know anymore because it's all big. It's all lies. Mm -hmm. However, this woman says a thousand years was inserted into our history. And that, in fact, it's really 1015. Uh, right. I've now. heard that. You've heard that. Yes. I believe her, too, based on her information. She makes a case over a period of about 40 videos. That's terrific. And I yeah. want to get a hold of her and interview her for the, the revamping of the book that I'm writing right now. But um Anyway, yes, so that thousand years was inserted to justify the rulership of all of the houses, all of the imperial houses that are that are in power right now, and that they're all Prussian. And then there's another fellow, a German fellow, who's done um, apparently impeccable academic work that actually does prove that there was there was there were a couple of Jesuits. Oh, there they are again. There were a couple of Jesuits uh -huh. who sat down in, at about 1400 and rewrote history. Everything from 1400 back is complete and total bullshit. And um, that in 1400 was the first time anybody used the, the word, the term AD, Anno Domini. It just doesn't exist before then. Hmm. So, so there's all kinds of real good, solid, traceable evidence that it isn't just that our history has been monkeyed with in terms of, you know, they say the victor the victors rewrite history. I think that's, I think that's uh, too small a way to describe it. Mm -hmm. I think that we have been absolutely completely bollocks here. Um, but I always say that I, I say that now anyway, I mean, Greg, that's one of my things anymore. If you're following the interviews that I've been doing in the last couple of months since Harold and I did the microconference for Miles in about in June sometime, um, I really want us to adopt a position of radical thinking. <laughs> radical thinking, stop believing anything. Just stop believing right. anything. Question everything. And I mean everything. I... I go all the way to the question of how is it that life sustains itself, Greg? How is it that human beings sustain themselves? You know what? I think this this whole this whole life feeds on life thing is a big con to create uh, suffering, misery, blood sacrifices, and spiritual energy harvesting one animal to the next. We don't need that. We don't need that to survive. Come on, man. And I think that. I think that I know I'm getting a little bit off the track here and I know you'll pull me back on, but I just mm -hmm. want to say while I'm thinking about it, that there was a, there was a professor at the university of Saarbrücken who proved categorically that when we ingest, we process, that's the best way to put it. We process something like 24, 25,000 units of energy each and every day, each and every one of us comes into us, through us and out of us in the form of photons, in the form of light energy. Now, how come? What is that? Obviously, you know, there are people who say the human body is a filter. I say that's probably true, but um, the human body is also the translator between the morphogenic field via the imagination and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I would suspect that this is how we originally sustained ourselves, that the addition of, and I'm not advocating that you abandon your belief system because we are, we are in the middle of a very, very real and strong and cruel belief system, but this whole food thing, you know, I don't know. Was <laughs> well, it always that way, Greg? It's a curious thing. I mean, there is a movie out there called Eat the Sun, which is fairly interesting. I mean, I, I don't know how much stock I put in it, but yeah, you got to question everything because there's been so much manipulation. So everything yep. has to be picked apart. And um, <laughs> so to uh, bring this back to education a little bit, 
one of the things that I've heard you break down that I really like, and I think it really categorically shows what they were trying to put in place when they put in the American school system. Uh, this guy, Professor Alexander Inglis, I guess he wrote in 1918, he wrote a book called Principles of Secondary Education, and he outlined six functions. Can you break that down for us? He did. He did. I don't have my book right in front of me, but I will tell you that now let me think about this because oh, Okay, hold on. I'll take this from my notes and I'm copying it into the Skype chat so you will have it. All right. Oh, why do I have it? Okay, hang on. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, I know who it was. Wasn't it Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, let's start with Jefferson and then I'll go to this. Sure. Okay, sure. I can't remember. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson had issued his idea of what education was supposed to be. And edu I don't have that right in front of me, but I will tell you that his idea of education was learning to stand up for your rights. Okay, um, being a sovereign individual, being able to say yes to things, to no, no to things, and to being able to defend your freedom. This was, this was learning in his, this was his idea of education and what learning was all about. Now, in 1818, yes, Inglis, who was a, an education professor at Harvard University, wrote this book in which he outlined, uh, what ended up being the accepted, I don't know why, but the accepted reasons for education. One, adaptive, established, it's adaptive. It establishes and fixes habits of reaction to authority. Mm. Okay, well, this is Prussian, right? This is about, um, this is obeying every command that comes to you. Mm -hmm. Conformity, making children as alike as possible. Directive, determining each child's social role. Okay, well, you know, a lot of what hap what's happening with the education system is that it's eugenics. It's also a eugenics experiment. And that was actually emphasized by the Rockefellers uh, in Texas in about 1850, mm -hmm. somewhere between 1850 and 1900. They formed a, a board of education as well um, and decided to make education and the schooling system part of a eugenics movement. OK, so if in in the in the case that 95 percent of the people in the world are what um has been termed permanently irrational, <laughs> which we should talk about too, because I actually consider myself to be that, and that's a good thing. Um, those permanently irrational needed to be housed, and they needed to be trained, and there needed to be a system put into place wherein they would not rise any higher than their abilities, um, judged by, of course, the 5%. They were trained for jobs. They were trained uh, and the 5% were, tra were trained to manage the 95%. So, so determining each child's social role, it was all about identifying um, children who could be one thing or another, mm. um, which, which eliminates your free will and it eliminates your ability to, uh, to um, fulfill your destiny, whatever that may be. Okay. Right. Um, and differentiating, sorting and trained by directive. Same thing, same thing. Um, that means coming up with assessments, uh, which we do now. Standardized we, uh, tests. In fact, yes, standardized <laughs> tests and assessments. Parents drive me crazy because because they're so brainwashed. They want to know, uh, well, how do you assess the children? In other words, how do you sort and categorize my child so that he doesn't rise any higher than he's supposed to? That's how trained we are, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's selective. You tag poor students with bad grades to create an underclass. Yes, you do. Now, this is eugenics as well, because you're selecting children who no one is going to want to mate with because they're they're not good enough. Bad seeds, the bad students. These are bad seeds. You're selecting out. Dumb kids. Yes, these are the dumb kids. It's, it's quote unquote dumb kids. Right. You just don't know if that's the case. OK, because honestly, Greg, any child who cannot conform to the to school system that we have in place then and now, and it basically it's the same thing. It's just gotten worse. Um, is actually a free spirit, someone who cannot be molded. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, this is the superior race that you're talking about, not the inferior race. It's not the inferior race who can't be made to march in place without questioning. The superior race is the one who can't be made to march in place without questioning. Okay. But we don't know that anymore. Anyway, and, and this is what standardized tests are about. Um, and then teaching. Yes. 
teaching. I, I see this written here, teaching the suck ups to self police or enforce the system. <laughs> right. Those I are my know, own notes. I was going to say, dude, I didn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought that was a really important aspect, an important function. It is. Yes, yes. Reinforcing for the system. If you want to free yourself, you know, you get these people brainwashed and then you have a student council and you have the uh, valedictorians and you get these people who it, it becomes a self-policing system and the suck ups, the hall monitors, they come down on the uh, on the free spirits. And then as the elite, you don't even have to do anything. You already got them so brainwashed right. that the whole system is on autopilot. Well, yeah, you just create this hamster wheel and everybody keeps running on it, you know? Yeah. But there's a couple of things. I mean, there there are things you're going to have. I hope you're going to get John Taylor Gatto on your show. Mm -hmm. I trying. know you're trying. I know you're trying. And if you can, I will be I will be sitting right there listening because <laughs> he is the he's the man to go to for all this stuff. There is no one in this country, maybe in the world, who has a better handle on what's going on, what what was, what is, and what we have to stop mm -hmm. in the education system than John Taylor Gatto. And I have to tell you, you probably know this, but um, his grandfather was uh, John Taylor. I think his first name was John. Anyway, he invented this thing called Taylorism for the industrialists. And Taylorism was all about compartmentalizing um, all the workers and taking away their power and removing them from context so that they couldn't stand up for themselves or defend themselves or ask for a humane working environment or humane working wages. OK. Mm -hmm. And Taylorism went all around the world. Right. You take Taylorism, combined it with Fordism, which was the assembly line. And what you have is a worker who. And by the way, this is the school system still. The school system is a big old compartmentalized assembly line. Don't don't think it isn't because it is. Taylorism was taken into the schools and so was Fordism and so was Pavlov's, you know, con operant conditioning. Right. For people who don't know about Pavlov's thing, he trained dogs to uh, come get water at the sound of a whistle. And then after a while, he'd take the water away, he'd blow the whistle and their mouths would salivate because they had now been trained to associate drinking water with uh, that whistle. And that is kind of where we adopted the bells in school, it seems. It is. Absolutely. It's operant conditioning. We change classes to the ringing of bell and that's Pavlovian. This is behaviorism, which we've got to talk about as well. Right. Um, there's a book out. What is it called? Oh gosh. Um, I, I will remember and I will tell you in a minute, but um, the behaviorists. All right. This started with Pavlov and a fellow called John Watson, who worked with worked at uh, Johns Hopkins University. These were the true mad scientists. These were the ones who were only interested in finding out how the human being ticked, not because they wanted to know how the human being ticked it and have it that be it. They wanted to know so they could figure out how to how to um, make the human being do what they wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. In other words, be, uh, uh, behavior modification is another way of putting that. I mean, if you're old enough, you remember the all of the behavior modification. It was all the rage in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, people were really into that in terms of um, what they thought was mental health healing. Um, but, you know, Pavlov began it and uh, Pavlov's, Pavlov's techniques were brought into the schools. Pavlov's techniques for operant conditioning were brought into the workplace uh, John Watson, he <laughs> spent, he, he made a career out of learning how to make babies fear things. Okay. Wow. Uh, that was his thing. You know, we're not really born afraid of anything, but we are born with the capacity to be a very, it's very easy to make a baby afraid of something, a human afraid of something when they're a baby. And so what he did was take babies at Johns Hopkins University and try to figure out how to make them afraid of things, whether it was, uh, I think the most famous uh, experiment he did was there was a, a rabbit. He, there was a baby, uh, one of the nurses at the hospital, um, volunteered her child for some reason. And uh, there was a baby, a laughing, happy baby. I think they called him baby Albert. And uh, Watson let him play with this really soft, furry bunny and wasn't that great. And, and everything was, was wonderful. But then he started um, making a really seriously loud, crashing, sudden noise behind the baby's head every time the rabbit appeared. And it didn't take very long before the baby started to cry every time the rabbit showed up. Huh. That's how easy it is. But let me. And so he worked on this for a very long time 
And um, this was picked up by people at the Tavistock Institute. This was picked up by people at the Frankfurt School, which we will get into as well, um, and used. I mean, this is traumatology, the very, very beginning of traumatology. So, um, by the way, John Watson ended his career on Madison Avenue. Hmm. And he ended his career with an office on uh, in the penthouse or something of a massive major advertising company. He, No one knew more about the human being at the point of purchase than John Watson. And he started out by scaring babies at Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. Wow. Anyway, these are the behaviorists. And then it goes all the way up to B.F. Skinner, you know. Um, B.F. Skinner, by the time we got there, the behaviorists had spent a lot of time re uh, defining what it was to be human or to be alive excuse me what is life what isn't life okay and i believe they took a page from the studies of plants which are very reactive in terms of turning to the light turning away from this and towards something good and away from something bad and i think at the baseline they decided since humans had that reactive sort of capacity to turn towards something good and away from something bad that really we had more in common with plants than anything that was living. And by the time we got to B.F. Skinner, we really didn't meet the criteria for life anymore. Wow. This stuff is super fascinating. And one little uh, thing I did get out of your book that I thought was a, a brilliant point is why in school do we have all the kids get up at the ring of the bell and go from classroom to classroom rather than the teachers. The teachers would be so much more efficient at rotating around the school. And also kids are, you know, they have too much energy. They're not paying attention. They get distracted. It's a pain in the ass to move all the kids from room to room, but they do it because <laughs> it's hurting kids. It it's getting them in it a, is. you know, in a pattern and it's conditioning. It really is. And it makes so much right. sense from that standpoint. Right, right. It is conditioning. It also creates um, a very controlled and parenthetical attention span. You know, you pay attention from this end of the parentheses to that end of the parentheses. Then there's a ring of a bell and you go you go someplace else. It also means that the teacher, I mean, it, it reinforces the teacher as an authority figure, which isn't necessarily bad, but it doesn't make any sense to herd these children through chaos. If you remember being in school and being in the halls of your secondary school or your high school or your junior high, that's just chaos. Right. There's nothing, there's nothing um, orderly about the transition from one class to the next. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of chaos, ringing the bell again, oh, and that's, oh, be quiet now, sit down, listen to the authority, and then ring the bell, get up, you know, play bumper cars in the hallway, go to your next class, ring the bell, sit down. It's that's just classic operant conditioning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Henry Ford. And I do specifically remember learning about the big crowning achievement of Henry Ford with the assembly line in school. And I remember even setting up a mock assembly line in class and being told how great a system it was. And I do remember thinking, this doesn't sound right. Who wants to do this for a living? It's not a great system. It's not a great system. And you know what? Henry Ford said flat out, he's, he said, he was not stupid enough to fall for that kind of stuff, but the, the masses were. Okay, mm -hmm. he, he would. He said he never would have fallen for anything like that, but definitely the mass of the masses of the workers would do it. Now we got to a point with John Taylor and um, and Taylorism and uh, and the scientific management programs that were put invented and put into place, where in fact they could on the assembly line monitor. The turning of a screw 57 seconds out of every 60 and have that be the goal. Can you imagine? This is for a human <laughs> being. This is right. the goal for a human being. Talk about not having any context. Mm -hmm. And they took the context away from people as a result of an interesting set of folks who were uh, throwing their weight around a little bit and trying to change lives and demand their rights. And it used to be, if you know anybody, I don't know if they have them anymore, but my brother was a machinist. Um, there used to be this wonderful uh, craftsman uh, called a machinist. And a machinist was kind of magic. A machinist could make anything and solve any problem and was very often given uh, a, cont a contextual problem to solve mechanically, yeah, mm -hmm. like a handyman, mechanical handyman. Well, sort of, yeah. They definitely, they definitely knew they could use metal. They could use all kinds of um, tools with metal to make a hole, 
like whether it was a car oh. or whether it was a piece of machinery. Uh, they made the machines that made the machines, really. Uh -huh. um, machinists were extremely highly skilled, highly skilled workers, and they had a union and they were very important. And it was the industrialists who got tired of it. They got tired of, of this, the machinists having that much power. And so that's one of the reasons that they brought, they were interested in bringing over um, the Prussian schooling system making, I mean, it goes all the way back. Hmm. The Prussian schooling system, mandatory schooling, uh, Taylorism, scientific management, uh, taking people out of context and make, instead of having this sort of craftsman, this guildsman who could, who could make anything, you had, uh, that was reduced to someone turning a screw, the same screw into the same hole, 57 seconds out of every 60. Huh. So that is what, ha ha that's what happened. If you don't have context, you cannot argue for your, for your life because you have no, you have no information for, wh for which, with which to argue. Right. And if some people think this is, uh, you know, paranoia or not that big of a deal, I mean, how many people out there are unhappy working for some shitty company that these elite probably set up in the beginning? What, 75% at least? I mean, the, the plan is clearly working. And if you are stuck in that kind of situation, you got to look at this context to understand how you got there. Right, right. And then they brought in these this thing and then they brought in, uh, I mean, they knew this was happening. They knew this was happening. And um, so they devised a way to give us um, a perception that we had some control over our lives by forming these groups at workplaces who, you know, it's kind of like the suggestion box, but only sort of on steroids, you know, these groups that would get together and try to address working conditions, but only to a certain extent, mm -hmm. and also giving their workers access to mental health care because, you know, you need to shrink if you, <laughs> if you're trying to get through your life with this kind of a, of a soul robbing, mind robbing job, you end up needing help a lot. This is what <laughs> the midlife crisis is about. Right. This is why men and then women as well, but this is why men in particular for a long time at the age of 40, 45, 50 all of a sudden woke up and realized that their life had been stolen from them. And right. of course they were upset, you know? Mm -hmm. And we reduce it to something silly and tell them to go buy a motorcycle. Exactly. They had no recourse. I mean, they couldn't get their lives back and they really were too brainwashed to break it down and find out what happened to them because we are taught that everything that comes our way as we go through the, uh, the course of our lifetime in the 20th century is the way it's supposed to be. And if we have a problem with that, there's something wrong with us. Right. Only that's that's breaking down now. That's breaking down rather quickly, I think. It is. Um, so, yes, the schooling system is uh, if you love your children and you can manage it, I recommend to you that you get them out of a government run school immediately. If you live in a country where you can do that, there are countries now where it's becoming illegal. So you need to watch that in the United States because that's probably coming down the chute right now. It's legal. It's very, very legal really to homeschool your child in the United States. I've done it myself. I'm lucky. I've got a master's degree in Waldorf education. I have a, a very alternative training anyway. But if you cannot in Germany, for example, it is illegal to homeschool your child. If you try it, you will be they will your child will be put into into care and you will be arrested. Really? That's that's how serious they I mean, they they don't want any free thinking anywhere in the world if they can shut it down. And homeschooling is one of the best ways to do that. If you cannot do anything about homeschooling, if that's just not within the realm of what's possible for you. Um, there are alternative types of schools and I don't necessarily mean charter schools who, uh, the kind of schools that are just sort of taking the government, tra the government, you know, model and, and putting it in a different kind of school. Cause it's the government model. That's the problem guys. It's not, <laughs> it's not, yeah. Don't think, be very, very careful. Yeah. It's, um, if you can find a Waldorf school in the United States, if you, even a Montessori school, these alternative pedagogies, these alternative paradigms, please check them out. Anything that focuses on the imagination, which is our primary tool. I mean, we can if we can imagine something different because we are that powerful, we can make it happen. Um, so breaking down the imagination, relegating it to 
the lowest class status that there is. Oh, that's only your imagination. Oh, come on. You know, um, right. that was another thing that was done to us. The, the schooling system that was set up that we end up in now was meant to divide one hemisphere from the other. That's not natural that our left and right hemispheres don't talk to each other, folks. It's not. But if you sever those capacities because one side is is analytical and one side is imaginative, then you have far less access to your imagination, mm -hmm. meaning you have far less, less access to your strength and your power. I did find that really interesting in your book, too, because... We are told we are either a left brain person or a right brain person. And there's very Nonsense. little talk about crossover whatsoever. And I think that that's a, yeah, that is a pretty important point. We should be whole brained people instead of compartmentalized like they want us to be. It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. That is a manufactured division that your right brain and your left brain should be talking to each other. That's what's natural. Mm -hmm. How could it be any other way if you think about it? Right. How in the world could it be any other way? But but they've got us in a situation where uh, they train us to not to dismiss everything that has to do with our imagination. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say while we're talking about the imagination, because this is one of my prime theses, and that is that um, the imagination is everything for us. It is our power and it is. Uh, what is so dangerous to those who would be co-creators on this planet, but cannot because they don't have an imagination or a heart space or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, my premise, and I believe this with all my heart, is that um, human beings translate what's in the morphogenic field, which is the stuff of materiality the, or the working material, yeah, the clay, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we translate that via the mechanism of our imagination and we manifest what's material on this planet. It's kind of an organic hologram, if you will. I, I, for a long time, I didn't want to use the word hologram. I didn't like it. Um, but we do know that what we uh, manifest isn't permanent. But right. what it is, is it's enlivened. Okay. We enliven it. We give it life. That's how important you are out there. Okay. You need to understand that. Wake up to that fact. And the way we do that is via our poor, stifled, shut down <laughs> imaginations. Okay. Yeah. So you have to understand how important your imagination is and, um, and, um, really get to know it and love it and realize it's working all the time anyway. They can't really stop it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that part is really interesting as well. It's like uh, kind of what occultists today are talking about, which of course are a huge minority, but it seems like if there was once a time where we were very in tune with our imagination and our creative power of manifestation and mm -hmm. through these behaviorists and these boards of education and this Prussian system, they've weeded that away from people. Yeah. It seems like uh, in the modern day, that's what these occultists are talking about. They're preserving that tradition in the underground to some extent. Yeah. 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 But you can do it too. You can do it too. Absolutely. They're saving that for themselves and telling us that, you know, that our imaginations are silly, but you know, and, and that our imaginations are nothing, but you know what? They're not nothing. They're everything. They're everything. And each and every one of us has a mighty, mighty imagination. Why do you think they want to get to the children about age three? I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that um, we are still imaginative I mean, we still are completely directly linked to our imaginations, to that capacity, to that power. Mm -hmm. Okay. They want to get us younger, 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 younger. And by the way, hook us into computers because doesn't that, doesn't that separate us from our imagination? It makes mm -hmm. us very, very passive, makes us rely on the computer to create things when in fact the computer is simply a dim replica of something that we can already do. There is nothing, I, I mean this with all my heart, there is nothing technical out there, nothing that we, a human being, can't already do. But hmm. there is a, there's an artificial intelligence. Does this sound familiar? There's an artificial <laughs> intelligence that um, would like to be a co-creator. And anytime you find a, a synthetic fake biology, like a computer or a clone, or something along those lines, then, then you're talking about something that has no life. Okay. Um, this is something that a human being can already do. 
All right. We just, we don't believe that about ourselves anymore. We've been taught not to believe it. Right. This is actually something that one of my um, professors in teacher training taught me that the computer is simply a dim, a dim, and even as powerful as you think it is, it's still a dim replica of the human brain. We can already do this stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't even need telephones. We don't. <laughs> I mean, that is interesting. And like you said, a lot of people don't believe this about themselves. So for people who are in denial or are skeptical about the power of this imagination, how can we strengthen or regain the manifestation ability? Yeah. Well, okay. You just said it yourself. We're always manifesting. We're always manifesting. Um, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because you really have to give yourself permission to accept the mighty power that you have, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that the baby steps are the only way to go. The first thing you should do is get yourself and your children away from the tell. Okay, first of all, you have to get yourself away from the things that are distracting you and keeping you vibrating on a frequency that's unnatural, okay? When you're not vibrating on a frequency that's unnatural, you'll be able to locate eventually probably sooner than you think the frequency around you that is natural. Not that we're not surrounded by demonic, you know, frequencies all the time. We are. Mm -hmm. And that's on purpose. That's absolutely on purpose. But my suggestions to you, if you can only do two things to get yourself in touch with your imagination, because, okay, here's what you need to do. First of all, throw your TV out of your house. Just get rid of it. Huh. Okay. That TV, that television, it's not redeemable. It was never invented for, there was no purpose that it was invent for which it was invented that was, that would make it redeeming now. It was invented to mind control you. That's why they call it programming. Okay. And the vibration at which it hits you is seducing you into a coma. Mm -hmm. All right. Number one. Number two, I have read that if you ever have anybody from the intelligence service come into your house to question you, do you know what the first thing they do is? No. They turn off the television. <laughs> if the television is on in your house, they turn it off. Now, what does that tell you? Weird. Lots of things, I think. Okay. So turn off your TV. That's number one. Number two, get your children and yourselves out of traditional schooling systems. All right. Those are the two first things that you need to do. Um, that will clear a lot of space for you to hear what's going on inside your head. And all of us are familiar with this self-talk mm -hmm. that goes on. All right. That's you talking to your higher self, talking to your, your, uh, material self that happens all the time. Start listening to that. Start listening to that. Okay. So those are the things that I would do to begin with. And I think if you start to pay attention to what's going on around you and you start to, to practice this, believe that you can create something material. We all have these experiences. If we're paying attention where we think about something and then huh, there it is, right? Mm -hmm. We call it acts. We call these things accidents, coincidences. They're not. That's your power. <laughs> you do this stuff all the time. So just just eliminate a lot of the noise that's in your life that you can eliminate and then start to pay attention to what you're actually doing. All right. That's difficult. That's difficult um, in a lot of in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's easy, but it's it's simple, but it's difficult. It's difficult because we are drowning in noise right now. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely on purpose. They have drowned us in noise so that we can never, 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 never hear ourselves think. Okay. Yeah. So you've got to turn off as much of that noise as you can. Don't read any newspapers. Uh, they only want you to see the headlines anyway. Um, don't, I don't go to any movies. I can't go to any movies anymore, Greg, because all I see is the damn psyop that's being <laughs> run on me. I can't do it. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to understand what you're living in. You're living in a total fake out, oh. a total, complete fake out. Stem, if you've seen the matrix, have you seen the matrix out there? Because that's a true story. Yeah. That's absolutely a true story. That's what's going on. Right. We are being harvested for our energy, by the way. Do you know, I just did this thing for, I, I'm sorry, I keep getting off track. Maybe there are things you want to talk about yeah. that you'll bring me back to, but I just did an interview for Miles Johnston where I talked about, um, the collie on the, on the side of the Empire State Building. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I do have that in my notes. You mentioned that to me, and I, of course, had to write down 
Callie and the Empire State Building, question mark? <laughs> Callie and the Empire State Building, yeah. Do you remember on August 13th of this year that appeared on the side of the Empire State Building? Absolutely fell off my chair when I saw that. Hmm. Because of all the, I mean, come on. That's like a 9-11 event, really. Was it some kind of ritual? Well, let me tell you what that is. <laughs> let me tell you what I think that is. <laughs> all right. First of all, it, you know, that bothered me for a very long time. And then I went through a period of about 36 hours where there was just this stuff coming through me as much as my former or, and maybe, and maybe future, depending on how this plays out, writing partner relies on his scientific sort of, um, mind to, to deal with stuff. I rely on my intuition. It all comes through me. I'm clairvoyant. And all of that. Okay? okay. So I was being bothered. I was being seriously bothered. And sometimes it comes through me like um, Niagara Falls. It's like holding one of those big fire hoses, you know, that they turn on big fires. <laughs> anyway, so I, I it happened to be happening to me when I was talking to Miles and, and, and um, recording this interview. The, fo- the, the, the official story that was put out about that was that um, it was an artist called Louis Saihoyos who uh, had created this image of Kali to bring attention to the plight of the animals and the other uh, living beings on this planet. And God knows that needs to be drawn attention, that attention needs to be drawn to that. But, um, and subsequently the need for a new avatar. Mm -hmm. All right. So for me, this is already a serious pondering situation, a new avatar. Okay. So what I did was the morning, that morning of the interview, I actually took that name apart, Cy Hoyos. And Cy, because it's, it, no, one, no one has that name. No one has that name. Come on. Right. Cy Hoyos. So PSI stands for particle physics. Hoy stands for, um, Hoy is the name of a little boat in Scotland that conveys goods and services and people up and down a river. It's like a transport system. And OS, people were thinking that probably stood for Osiris, but it doesn't. It stands for operating system. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, I had this in my brain. I already knew that outside the CERN facility in Geneva, Switzerland, there's a statue of Shiva. And Shiva is the god of stillness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, I had just discovered that inside the CERN facility, the, um, fine calibration system for the particle accelerator is called Kali. Wow. All right. Yeah. Most people don't know that, but um, it's interesting that they would call it Kali. All right. So what do you have if you put all those things together? Because I was thinking about CERN. CERN has been in the news. CERN has never bothered me. I think CERN is never going to work. Um, hmm. Yeah. I think it's just another mad scientist thing that's going on for various reasons, but this thing shows up on the side of the Empire State Building. And for me, it goes back to CERN. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to CERN because if you take that guy's name apart, it's particle physics being conveyed via an operating system. Okay. And you've got Kali and uh, Shiva out, uh, literally in the CERN facility. Okay. Um, Miles, uh, Miles, in the end, decided that that had to do with the Black Goo and the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland, which was, uh, it's probably right, which was a um, symbolic battle. It wasn't a real battle. It was a symbolic battle that retold the story of an alien entity that came to this planet. Okay. Right. I thought that was really interesting. I heard that uh, an interview, like it was a, a staged battle, a ritual just to try to um, mirror this ancient alien race invasion. Yes, that's what it was. And so and so we end up with Kali on the side of the Empire State Building and a message that has to do with CERN. And so I've been spending time trying to figure that out. What does that have to do? Because because obviously this is about a marriage between the gesture of, of Kali and the gesture of Shiva and the blending of movement. She's the goddess of time. She's the goddess of movement. She's the goddess of destruction. She's the goddess of lots and lots of things, not just destruction. She's, this is, this is a very powerful entity, a very powerful metaphor, if you will. And Shiva is all about stillness. And so if you combine movement and stillness, I think, 
I think this is a signal, a metaphor, a message to everyone that what they're after is um, the singularity. They're after uh, breaking through to where they can manipulate light. Because if you mm. saw that interview, I'm sure I was doing a better job during that interview, but light has no charge. Light has perfect symmetry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Material things have charges. They're, they're not symmetrical. They're positive. They're negative, but light, which by the way, goes through our bodies in the form of photons and then out into the material world. Um, can once it's broken, if you will, that's the only, the best way I can think of to describe it. Um, it, it, it takes on a charge. It becomes a material thing. So you see for me, when I think about those two things side by side, I see us um, allowing allowing photons to come through our body from probably the morphogenic field uh, mm -hmm. and creating materiality via the imagination. This is how we create. To me, I just described to you how we create material, the material world around us mm -hmm. by talking about the light that comes through us, takes on a charge and becomes the material world around us. Now you're talking about CERN, Kali, and Shiva go combining to yeah. become the singularity, to get to the point where they can manipulate light and become co-creators. So those two things went side by side for me. Anyway, yes, I digress from education, <laughs> but that's what it was. That's what it was. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Makes so, sense. um, yeah, so we've got about, I don't know, what do we got about 10 minutes? So let me talk yeah, briefly I'm... about the situation that we're finding ourselves in. Right Please. Now because I want to, um, yeah. Just to, to preface a little bit, I mean, I guess we're going to talk about Harold. Yeah, we are. And uh, I just had him on a couple weeks ago for the listeners. I'm sure you remember. I think he does great work. But now this new direction he's gone in saying that it's all going to be okay and we'll be saved by higher beings. Uh, I, I don't think you share these thoughts, right? No, I don't. In fact, it was your interview that I listened to that made the top of my head blow off, really, mm. in terms of in terms of what in the world is going on with Harold. And then at the end of the of the interview, when you said, wow, you know, mm -hmm, that's kind of could go either way. But um, I guess we'll have to take Harold at his word. I mean, it was obvious that he had said some things that were um, dangerous, really, mm -hmm. that were uh unnerving that were red flags that were um that were just not okay he did not warn me <laughs> that he was going to do this kind of stuff he just did it and i think that i really think well there's a couple things going on um the reason that this happened is global uh harold in his mind however much of his mind is actually still being controlled by harold which i at this point don't think is a, a lot um probably didn't realize that um, it was the, you know, he doesn't realize um, information is very global and instant. You know, I know that he put out a, um, okay, here's, here's how I started to find out about it. I listened to your interview and then um, it was that day or the next day, I got a text from Miles Johnson asking if we would be interested in doing some conferences in Ireland. And uh, then the next day I got another I got another message from Miles saying that Harold had released something in German about the X factor or X stream or X something, X beam. I don't know. It was in German, so I didn't understand it. Well, wave X. Yeah, he talked about that briefly. Wave X. Yeah. Well, in that particular video, he had really slagged off England and a lot of the people who interviewed him and, you know, just 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 really done some nasty things. Uh then he then he translated that into English, but those particular parts, of course, were left out. Now, not realizing, of course, that that there are many people involved in this a movement that speak many languages, so that just wasn't going to stay hidden for very long. And so, then the flames started to rise, you know. And the fact of the matter is, the man is saying that he's possessed. The man is saying that he's possessed by some entity that he calls the Elder Er, the Elder Er. Now. I don't really care who they are. They're not, um, we're not looking for a savior, savior. We're not looking for a new avatar. This is not, this, in my opinion, in my opinion, this is not good. Mm -hmm. This is not good. This is bad. All right. 
It almost undoes the work that he's been talking about for so long by yes, saying, does. here's yes, all the details, does. but don't worry about it. But that's the point, see? That's the whole point. It does undo the work that he's been doing. Now, that really is the whole point. It, he and I were just really getting the English-speaking world to open up to what we were trying to say. Really worked. I, I've told you and I've told a lot of people, I personally worked on it for four years. Harold and I have worked on it for a couple of years. And we were just really, we were getting um, invitations to go speak in Australia, finally getting a voice in Australia that was so hard, getting invitations to come and speak in the United States, which actually I found rather scary, but we were, <laughs> we were going to go do it. Um, and these things were just coming in. And then all of a sudden, Harold throws a grenade into the middle of the whole thing, you know, um, and does a 180 about everything and says, no, we've already lost. Evil has won. We just need to give up and accept it and move on. But there are some entities here that can help us. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, but I can't. I can't. I mean, I can't tell you how 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 bad and evil and wrong that feels to me. Mm -hmm. And to come out of Harold, you know. So you think he's been compromised? Well, I know he's been compromised. There's no way he hasn't been compromised. And he will tell you himself that it's happened to him before. He's been possessed before. It's happened before. If you look through his previous interviews, I'm sure he's talked about it because he'll talk about it. He talks about anything. All right. But um, he has weak spots. He has weak spots just like we all do. And the fact of the matter is nothing can possess you without an invitation from the host that's the way it is. That's the that's the law of magic. So um, I don't know what's going on with Harold. I have um, the only the only real message. Well, a couple, I got a couple of messages from him when I first emailed him and said, what exactly is going on? Um, we're being you know, everything's everything's falling apart within minutes here because you've done this 180. He said, oh, he, his his response to me was that. He was embarrassed by my need for the attention. Now, I'm sorry, but that sounds like a demonic entity talking to me. Mm -hmm. It just does, because it couldn't have been further from what I was trying to find out from him. So there, so I stopped trying to talk to him because that's just nonsense. That's like talking to a demon. Okay. Um, and then the next thing I know, he's, he's issued this, this video uh, with my name in the title you know, to Kara St. Louis and those who think I've been taken. I actually haven't listened to it. Oh, I haven't no. listened to it because I have to stay at zero point about this. I have to stay neutral. I cannot get emotional about this. Wow. Do you see what I'm, do you see what I'm saying? I do. Because I have to go forward. And if I get emotional about it or get sucked into any of the drama, then I'm at risk. Mm -hmm. And I can't be at risk. I just have to let it go. Yeah. Now, um, I did want to talk about it because I wanted people, you know, I am the other half of this. I'm, a, I'm the other half of this writing team that did Dangerous Imagination. And for me, the biggest, the biggest and most important thing is for people to realize that not only has, I mean, people have given their all for this in many ways. My mom, she's dead. My mom died in a crosswalk so that the sun thief could be born. Okay. Which is your other Harold, book? Harold, which is what my, well, I have three, but yes, that's, For that's people who don't the other know. book. Um, the Sun Thief is about, is about all kinds of things. But um, yes, my mother died so that that book could be born. Harold, in my opinion, is now a shell with something talking through him. So when wow. I talk about this, I almost feel like I'm, someone else has died, you know, so that. Let's not. So what I, the reason I wanted Greg to allow me to have this time to talk about this is not because I want any bad things to happen, you know, to Harold or, or anything else. I think that Harold and I have worked together in many lifetimes. I think sometimes we've been on the same side and sometimes we've been on opposite sides, but we both, we agreed that this message needed to get out, that this mess, the time was now and we needed a no excuses book. And this was gravely, gravely important. 
So my job, one of my jobs right now is to protect the momentum of dangerous imagination, silent assimilation, because otherwise everybody has died for nothing. Everybody, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. If this does not go forward into the English speaking world, yeah, mm -hmm. then all of this will have been in vain. And whatever bit of Harold is left in there, let's do, you know, let's do this. Let's just, let's just keep the momentum going because, right. and by the way, nothing, Harold is the only one who can save Harold. I can't do it. Nobody can do it, but Harold, he's got to do it himself. Mm -hmm. So that's his own personal battle. And he's been through some mighty, mighty battles in his, this particular incarnation. I know about them. I've been friends with him and we've had, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours of long, deep, personal, esoteric discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've known, I know he's fought some massive fucking dragons. All right. <laughs> he has. Right. But right now something's got him right now. Something's got him. So for the rest of us, we need to, we need to protect the material that's out there and get it. Keep, keep getting it out there, please. Mm -hmm. It's such a shame that this new direction from Harold has caused such a division for you guys. Well, that's a division amongst um, the people who are listening to us. Interestingly enough, I don't. People are I mean, taking have, sides. Yeah. You know, I kind of, I kind of know where, I, I mean, I don't want to say I know where Harold's at because there's something in Harold, but, um, it isn't there's it's the people who are who are creating this division and 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 frankly stopping us getting this this message into the english speaking world and creating by the way another duality yeah right which would be Harold on one side and me on the other is an old trick of the um i'm say illuminati really uh, the prussian system <laughs> you know this duality the divide and um, conquer this is where evil lives, divide and conquer. That's right, divide and conquer. So please, people, don't fall for this. Forget me and Harold. Forget the forget the people who are arguing about this and take a look at the PSYOP that's being run right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Look at the material. Look at the material. That's to keep it out of the English speaking world and divide and conquer between me and Harold because we proved to be a pretty powerful duo getting this getting this into the english speaking world so that's why i wanted to say it to greg and i wanted to say it on the same show where the shit hit the fan <laughs> yeah i i mean i appreciate it i appreciate the clarity because i did think that that was a weird little asterisk on the the show we did that that change at the end and i mean who am i to say you know i'm just some some dude with a microphone, but you're a guy, you know, you know what feels right and wrong. Though. You <laughs> I know what feels right and wrong. Yeah. It's that savior motif that I'm always skeptical of that, that, yep. you know, don't worry. You don't have to do anything. I know it's bad, but just sit there. Don't do yeah. anything because somebody yeah. behind the scenes has got it. Yeah. Really? Well, behind the scenes, they haven't been doing a very good fucking job for the last couple of centuries. Right. Right. <laughs> I just spent two hours explaining how we, how they've trained us to be passive and powerless. Right. You know, we'll take care of it for you. How is this any different? It's not. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this big old, it's a big old number. Don't let it be run, please. Don't let it be run. And I, you're, you out there are the only ones who can stop it by not walking into it. Boom. Well said. Well, Kara, very interesting and insightful stuff. That pretty much brings us to the end of the show. Uh, again, the book is Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation. Would you like to remind the people about your other books or any place they can check up on what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. We have, I have um, a magazine online called Vortex. You can get there by going to www.vortexcourage.me. Um, I also have, obviously, an author's page on Facebook. You can go there. Uh, I have three books out. One is Consolata's Companion, um, which I thought was fiction. And apparently, I was already writing about the Archons back in 2004 and didn't know it. Hmm. Um, and then I have uh, The Sun Thief. The Sun Thief is a very thinly fictionalized account of the death of my mother, who had a very high security clearance and worked for Operation Paperclip scientists. And... Um, my investigation of chemtrails and mag, e -mag weapons and scalar weapons. And uh, I was able to put a character of a pilot in that book. And my friend, Mark McCandlish helped me with the aviation in that book. And it's actually a pretty, a pretty great um, thriller. 
on top of everything else. And then now I have Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation out with um, Harold Kautzvela. Uh, and before September 20, people say September 22nd, 2015, pre-922, pre they're okay with Harold. Okay. Now, I'm just going to let that be that. And um, and then I have another one I'm working on right now. I've taken my half of the book and I'm expanding it. And it is called, it'll be out in about a month called Dangerous Imagination Silent Assimilation Workbook. And it's out for pre-order at indie-kitchen.myshopify.com. People are actually already pre-ordering it because, and the reason they're doing that is because, because the people who ordered through Shopify um, were people who live in Australia, New Zealand, places like that, where Amazon wasn't, it wasn't willing to deliver the paperback, but the line is long. The line is long to get that book through Shopify. <laughs> so I think people are pre-ordering it. So they'll be first in line. So go ahead and do it if, if that, if you want to. Nice. Well, right on again. Thanks so much. I think this has been really fascinating. I think all the stuff about Prussia and the education system and the behaviorists, I mean, that really is the underlying structure that we find ourselves in today. So breaking it down, I mean, it's, it's imperative. So Great job on that. And uh, I guess keep fighting the good fight. Thanks so much for being here and take care of yourself out there. Hey, you too, Greg. I'll speak to you soon, yeah? All right. All right. Bye-bye. Well, we don't need no thought control, people. There it is. Cara St. Louis. I'm so glad I could finally get a guest who's really looked into the dastardly designed system of education and allowed us to get deep into it. Because there will be people who say this is overblown, and yet it's as simple as a bunch of billionaire industrialists and banker criminals deciding to use their money to corner, quote, education and make sure the masses are spoon-fed dribble that could never produce the kind of person that could compete with them. It's not complicated. It's good old capitalism. And when you incentivize greed, this is what you get. A finely tuned, multifaceted machine built to secure wealth for the lucky few. And really, a lot of us don't have too much choice in the matter. And yes, young parents do have to struggle with options that might seem isolating. That's not fun either. I'm sure the whole meme that homeschooled kids are weird and unsocialized is just a perfect piece of propaganda to steer people away from it. But I'm sure there are no easy decisions these days as a parent. And even if you can't get your kids into an alternative school system due to its cost or your location or limitations with not seeing eye to eye with your partner, which I'm sure happens a lot too, I think the most important thing you can do is teach them that school is great for getting a job. But if you want to do something independent or entrepreneurial or creative, you're going to have to educate yourself too, you know? I talk a lot about being sent to a private Catholic school, and I was lucky because my parents just thought it was better, not really that I needed to be super religious. And when I would get in trouble at school for being rebellious and the school would have these dramatic meetings about how bad a kid I was, my parents just kind of rolled their eyes at a lot of that, and I think that kind of saved me. My group of friends all had parents who knew the school was a little draconian at times, so in some ways we drove the school even more crazy because we knew none of the punishments would ever really make it back home. And for years everything was fine and then St. Pius X High School in Festus, Missouri kicked me out on my first day of senior year for being just too rebellious really. There wasn't one final act that did it, they eventually just said, get out of here. And they can do that, it's a private school, but it sucked. Senior year, I've been in school with a lot of my friends since kindergarten. And to have that ripped away and be thrown into the mix at a public school with a bunch of strangers my last year, it was not an easy transition. But when I got to public school my senior year, wow, was that different. It was a teenage daycare compared to the crazy school I was coming from. I had so many, quote, credits even with the religion classes not counting, that four of my eight classes senior year were study halls, literally just sitting there. That's public school sometimes, or at least in my experience, just holding you like a job does. I'm so lucky to have made this gig work, and I do get a ton of emails from listeners who have been inspired by watching me do this and a day job for so long, and finally being able to transition to just this. It is a freaking lottery ticket, honestly, it is. I hope more of you take the leap and screw the school system for never giving you the right tools. It's not fair, but you got to learn to be a self-starter if you aren't. I know some people who have been at the same job for a decade hating it, saying every day, oh, I'm going to quit, oh, I'm going to quit. But never in their life, if you really think about it, has the system forced you to really go out 
and do something on your own. Yeah, you have to apply for jobs under the pressure, under the economic squeeze that you're a victim to. But once you've got one, it's so easy to get complacent, I know. But it's because they've got you used to hating eight hours a day since you were in kindergarten. You cannot accept that. If you don't free yourself, you then can't have the resources to ever fight back in a real way. And you have to shove off that fear of failure that's so nagging in everyone's mind. I know, it is tough, but it is so worth it too. I had to mail some conspiracies the other day, and I'm in line at the post office, and I hear one of the workers say to the other guy, just two more hours, man. And I really had to let that sink in. I haven't had to be stuck in a room for two and a half hours even once in over a year. I've only really had to do what I want to do. I haven't had to set an alarm for anything that wasn't something fun I had planned in over a year. And I'm not trying to brag about this, but I had so many teachers trying to break me, honestly, every freaking year. And I always felt like I was somehow right to fight it. And it's not something that I really talk about on the show. This is kind of ego service, but it's related to the topic, and it feels good to vent about. Of course, I did spend a decade lost wandering the desert of retail management. What a hellhole that was. But I did what I had to do, and I was never of the mindset that I was going to stop, that that was going to be it. I knew that was not a long-term solution. If you're not happy today, guys, it's not a long-term solution. And if you can't do it for yourself, or maybe if you already have, pay it forward. If there's a kid in your life, your own kid or a niece or nephew, or if you're a teacher, try to inspire and guide them away from complete indoctrination. Foster the creativity. Don't come down too hard on an independent kid. I wish one person had ever pulled me aside and said, dude, you're dealing with a bunch of ignorant, draconian, God-fearing, guilt-ridden, angry women in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. They hate everything about their sad situation and they're taking it out on you. It's their one source of power in the world, and they're going to use it here. Don't let them get you down, because you can do much better for yourself, and trust those instincts they try to squeeze out of you. And don't let them crush that rebellious streak completely. Who knows? God, I might have shaved off a few years of my lost decade. It definitely would have made me feel better. So if you can pass that message along to some kid in your life, do it. Could be a game changer. Someone's got to break that cycle. But after a great educational dismantling in the first hour, the second one got deeper into traumatology, the Tavistock Institute, the Frankfurt School, the idea of the folk soul, feminism, language manipulation, secrets of the Vatican, the black magic of money, some of the drama behind veterans today and the People's Voice Project that fell apart, and finally, Kara's fey bloodline and her connection to an interdimensional race of beings. Yeah, we covered some interesting ground there for sure, so do sign up if you enjoy the show. The second hour is always a nice addition, and every new member is a big slap in the face of St. Pius X High School in Festus, Missouri, and the witches that tried to make me just another brick in the wall. But get creative, people. The internet has opened the floodgates to independence, and you just need to choose your vessel and set sail, because when you regain control of your day-to-day, every other worry seems a little less important. And I want that for you. But you gotta fight for it. And I hope you do. That's it for me this week. Your move, creativity killers of the world. Your freaking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on.